Let me read to you a passage from the 12th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 8 to 12. It's the Gospel for Saturday of the 28th week in Ordinary Time. St. Luke writes, Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. That's from Luke chapter 12, verses 8 to 12. What does it suggest to us? Well, it speaks of bearing witness to Jesus, of course. You know, it's a strange thing, but for a long time in the modern era, Christian witness was thought to be the work of what we might call the professional in religion and not of the layman. Christ was to be spoken of by clergy and not by the laity. But the plainest reading of the Gospel shows that this is contrary to the intention of Christ. In our Gospel passage that I've just read, as we heard, Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. Our Lord is speaking to his disciples in general. In fact, the context of this statement is our Lord speaking to the multitudes. Chapter 12, verse 1. He is not speaking simply to the twelve. In particular, he addresses his friends. Chapter 12, verse 4. That is to say, our Lord's requirement that we acknowledge him before men applies to all his disciples, including those who do not have a special office in the life of the church. Many scholars place the eventual triumph of the Christian religion in the Roman civilization, in the Roman Empire, at the feet of the Christian laity, who bore witness to Christ in the pagan culture of their everyday life. At the time of the great Arian heresy in the 4th century, it was especially the lay faithful and the ordinary parochial clergy that saved the day against the new doctrine. At the time of Henry VIII's Reformation in England, an especially luminous witness was given by a layperson, Thomas More, who lived from 1478 to 1535. Consider Thomas More. His formal profession was civil law. He was the first lawyer in the kingdom. A great boost in interest in Thomas More came with the movie of Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons. What was striking about the layman Thomas More was his great learning in matters of the Catholic faith. Beginning with his love of the, for the humanities and classics, he acquired an excellent knowledge of Latin and Greek, and this in turn led him to read deeply in Scripture and in the early Christian fathers, such as St. Augustine. There came to be three burning concerns in his life. Disunion and enmity among the Christian nations of Europe, the threat to the Church from the rise of the Lutheran and Protestant opinions, and the danger arising from the great matter of King Henry VIII's marriage. Thomas More proved to be an admirable Catholic layman. He contributed to the peace of Europe by engineering the peace of Cambrai between Spain and France. He bore witness against Henry's right to divorce without a proper annulment, declaration of nullity, by the Holy See. And finally he wrote profusely, he wrote profusely and trenchantly against the new heresies. He defended obedience to the Holy See in these words that I now quote. He said, I am moved to obedience to that Holy See, not only by what learned and holy men have written, but by this fact especially, that we shall find that on the one hand every enemy of the Christian faith makes war on that sea, and that on the other hand no one has ever declared himself an enemy of that sea who has not shortly after shown most evidently that he was an enemy of the Christian religion. At his trial, from which he went to his death, 
he declared that not only could supremacy in the church not belong to a layman, but that, and I quote, it rightfully belonged to the See of Rome, as granted personally by our Lord when on earth to St. Peter and his successors. He knew that were he to go against his conscience, properly informed and enlightened as he had ensured it to be, he would be offending God. The point that I'm making here is that at a critical juncture in the history of England and of all Europe, when large populations turned away from the old faith, a layman, whom all regarded as an admirable person, stood his ground in witnessing to Christ's teaching on the church. He died for the doctrine on the papacy, even though the particular popes of the time were far from admirable themselves. He is an outstanding historical instance of one who acknowledged Christ and his teaching before men. In him the will of Christ that his disciples bear witness to him before the world was fulfilled. It is entirely appropriate that an impressive statue of him, of Thomas More, stands now in the Parliament of New South Wales, Australia. We need the example of witnesses to the faith to show us the way to bear similar witness ourselves in a secular era. In countless tiny ways we can bear witness to Jesus Christ in everyday life in a secular society. For instance, if having a meal in a restaurant before the gaze of others, why not hesitate? Why hesitate before saying grace before the meal and beginning grace with the sign of the cross? Or if passing a church where there is the blessed sacrament there, why not make the sign of the cross? Does human respect prevent us from bearing such witness? Let us be strong in giving our witness in a world that casts God from sight. 